McQuistian for over 28 years talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistian is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation, helping to educate the public about the fundamental principles of their democracy and thus be in a position to help formulate public policy. The University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future. Well, hello, I'm Dennis McQuistian, and this program is on the benefits and costs of immigration. And I have to say, for those of you who've watched this program over the years, that we've talked about this many times, and it's one of the most complex subjects that we've ever encountered. Jim, what do you think? Well, Dennis, it's not just complex. It's highly polarized. In fact, I was just looking at the Pew Research Center, and they said that immigration ranks fifth insofar as being a partisan issue. And get this, that's after uh, global climate change, that's after environment, the military, and gun control. But we're very fortunate today to have two exceptionally talented and thoughtful guests who are going to bring us, of course, different perspectives. Let me introduce first Dan Stein. He's an attorney by training. He's an internationally known immigration policy expert, and he's been president of the Federation for American Immigration Reform since 2003. In fact, he joined the organization in 1982 as its press secretary. Earlier in his career, Dan worked on Capitol Hill. He was a staff member on the House of Representatives uh, Select Committee on Narcotics Abuse and Control, and showing his stamina, and we'll see that on today's show, he's testified before Congress more than 50 times. Dennis, tell us about our other guest. Well, our other guest is uh, Ben Powell. Ben Powell is the executive director of the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech University, and there he's also a professor of economics in the Rawls College of Business, and he's a senior fellow with the Independent Institute. For those who follow books, he's involved with several books. One of the books he wrote is Out of Poverty, Sweatshops in the Global Economy. A book I really enjoyed was Socialism Sucks, one he wrote with Bob Lawson. Uh, it's two economists drinking their way through the unfree world. But the one we're going to talk about today, he's co-author of a book, of a book called Wretched Refuse, The Political Economy of Immigration and Institutions. Now, Ben, I heard you make a presentation at the Bridwell Institute at SMU a couple of weeks ago. And so tell that viewer uh, why the title and exactly what you mean by the political economy of immigration and institutions. Sure. So I think this is the biggest question regarding the beneficial aspects of immigration to the United States. The biggest challenge to it is immigrants come from poor countries and those countries are poor because they don't have a good rule of law, good enforcements of property rights, the norms that promote economic coordination. If they bring beliefs, formal or informal norms with them that are responsible for those institutions and changed our freedoms, our free enterprise center institutions that we have here in the United States, the gains economists forecast from immigration would shrink dramatically or maybe even turn negative. So what we're trying to look at is, is there empirical relevance to this? Do they really do that? Or is that not such a problem? Because if it's not, most of the other problems people debate about immigration are of second order effects because the gains are so potentially big, those other things could be dealt with. The idea, Ben, about changing institutions, what institutions specifically are you talking about? So I think most important is the institutions of economic freedom, the rule of law, the protection of private property rights, the freedom in the free enterprise system to, for entrepreneurs to engage consumer in, in competition to benefit consumers. And if instead, you know, if to make it concrete with immigrants, listen, if Cuban immigrants from socialist Cuba brought the beliefs responsible for socialism to Miami, there wouldn't be gains from immigration of Cubans coming to Miami. That's the type of fear that I'm, I'm most concerned with. The question is always uh, whether you know you're going to make your immigration policy decisions on the basis of what's good for this nation versus what the intending immigrants would like to do. There are only three basic questions in immigration policy. <clears throat> How many people are you going to admit? 
who are they going to be, and how do you enforce the rules? And <clears throat> under the assumption that the nation state, which is an idea that exists in the imagination of the American people is an important construct, the democratic process of making that decision of who gets to come and who doesn't is established by Congress. Those rules have to be enforced. If those rules are not, the rule of law collapses and therefore the basic principles that help build and make this nation great are compromised. So <clears throat> how immigrants come is important. What, what cultural assets they bring are important. I had the privilege of debating Julian Simon many times. He referred to negative externalities. When immigrants come, as Ben says, they bring cultural um, <clears throat> deficiencies in understanding free market capitalism, or perhaps they don't bring educational attainment. Maybe they're culture bound and tied linguistically to a particular community that affects their income earning power. How the immigrants do depend on who they are, what, what cultural assets they bring, what kind of economy they come into. Ben, I think you're shaking your head. Let's hear what you have to say. So, you know, actually, Dan and I are going to share a lot of views. And if immigrants actually did bring those cultural beliefs that distorted our free enterprise system, I bet you it would be a lot closer on agreement on what the optimal number or mix of immigrants is. But precisely the reason I did this book was to seriously empirically investigate this. And when we look across countries uh, over a 20 year time period with greater immigrant stocks or greater immigrant flows, and how does that change the economic freedom measured in the destination countries? We don't find this deterioration. In fact, we find improvements. When we look at case studies and think about the United States history, our time of government growth and a free immigration, I mean, we had a free immigration system where they came lawfully, but in any quantity and from any place in the world, basically from founding until 1920s, with the exception of the Chinese Exclusion Act. That's the period of smallest growth of government in the United States. In fact, the period of biggest government growth in detrimental to the free enterprise system in the United States is between closing the border in 1920 and reopening it in the 1960s. It, so I just don't think the evidence is strongly supportive of the idea that they do bring this. Instead, it's more representative, as we see, of the immigrants you know, who flee socialist Cuba are another best anti-communist voting bloc in the United States. Yeah, and, and Dan, here's the issue. You questioned some of the numbers, I think, the economic numbers. Uh, give us your perspective on that and why you think that Ben's empirical evidence may be wrong, or at least not the whole picture. Well, when we get into empirical research, I, you know, one always has to take a skeptical look at, at social science research put together by people with an ideological position, which tends to bias the research in favor of that position. I mean, you can apply a certain amount of common sense to the whole process. I mean, a person who brings a PhD in microprocessing, strong language skills, not a lot of family, uh, is going to do very well and their income earning potential is going to blow away the average American very quickly. You bring somebody who's illiterate in any language, uh, doesn't speak English, moves into a culture bound community where they're part of a linguistic ghetto, and they're going to have a very difficult time making the kind of income that raises them above the cost of the social safety net. As Milton Friedman would say, a socialist or, or welfare state is incompatible with massive, unlimited, unskilled immigration. So it winds up being a net cost to taxpayers. Now, this dynamic modeling that suggests that even if the person's illiterate, you know, he's going to marry somebody else and they're going to have an Einstein. I think we have to really be honest about the fact that we have to fashion immigration policy based on what's likely to give us the biggest bang for our buck. And that means numerically limited, strong skills based point system under an overall governing cap so that it doesn't stress American institutions. Because, you know, if immigrants come in large numbers, yes, in some cases they can slightly skew down the average age of the, of the American people and therefore prolong the Ponzi scheme of social security. But at the same time, if they overburden the schools, then all young people aren't getting the economics, the education they need to compete in a superpower post industrial economy. And if you look at the dependence we now see for tar on foreign labor for certain STEM, STEM skills, you have to say that our educational system is failing and not producing enough young people coming out of our- But, but, but Dan, you say that, and I'm, I'm looking at the pictures of all of us, and three of us are closer to retirement than someone. Um, <laughs> and why should we not be worried about job loss? I mean, are, are the immigrants going to take a job away from our grandchildren? That's a question that a lot of people ask. So the, uh, I'll address because this is one of the places where public debate about immigration is just vastly different 
than any trained economist debate about it. There are no professional economists to debate whether immigrants on net are going to take jobs from Americans. So much like in foreign trade, it changes the mix of the jobs that native born population does, but not the absolute number. The absolute number of jobs is driven mostly by the size of the labor force and then a bid on labor market regulation that gets you greater long term structural unemployment uh, of things like the current benefits package that pay people more not to work than to work. But increasing the number of available workers just increases the number of jobs. Where economists debate it is when they substitute for American labor most directly, like say low skilled to high school dropout, of what's the negative effect on wages, not the total number of jobs. But the debate on that is so small, from essentially zero to slightly positive to maybe negative 7%, and for a period of one to two years before they recover, it's really a second order concern among economists who debate this issue. Now, the fiscal effects that, that Dan's talking about, those are more debated because anybody can create a fiscal study based on whatever assumptions they want that gets them whatever answer they want. And you find all sorts of crazy ones out there. But probably the best distillation of that was the National Academy of Sciences study from a couple of years ago. And they find that most immigrant groups, including young unskilled laborers, are a net fiscal positive. So open immigration would be compatible with still having a welfare state contrary to Milton Friedman, but even if it weren't, fiscal policy is a policy variable. Change the way we tax immigrants to turn any immigrants that are a tax drain into a tax gain. Uh, uh, unskilled Haitian who moves to the United States, their income goes up by an average of 1,000%. Put a 10% permanent income tax on them uh, for immigrants only, and uh, it goes up by 990%. It's not gonna change the number who want to come, but it could address any tax funding gaps, which do occur at the local level on schools, as Dan pointed out. But the overall tax picture from immigrants isn't bad, and it's certainly changeable with fiscal policy. How do we make the argument, though, the difference between bringing in a lot of lower skilled laborers versus highly skilled? Because you know, that, that, that continues to be an issue, and I think people focus on the lower skilled, and that's why we, especially coming out of COVID, are, you know, have a higher unemployment rate than we have had. And we're concerned about that. Jim, have you seen the little meme of the little smiling girl that says, why not both? That's my position when it comes to the, the low skilled and the high skilled is we should let, be letting them both in because the low skilled bring us benefit too. In fact, actually, when I think about looking around the world, the United States has comparatively few low skilled workers compared to the rest of the world, but we have low skilled jobs that still need to be done in agriculture and mowing our lawns and other things like that. And when we bring a low skill laborer in, it frees up American labor to do things that are slightly higher skilled. Uh, in fact, think of like roofing or something like that. That's a, a moderate, moderately low skilled job. Uh, when I saw a roofing crew here in Lubbock, uh, it's mostly immigrants who are on the roof working but there's one native born American who's chief of the crew. Uh, if the immigrants weren't there, it'd be more native born would have to be doing the roofing. Instead, they move up a step in the skill level where their language skills are more important. All right, uh, Dan, let me uh, get to, let's just say the causes of this problem. Um, you guys have looked at immigration in all different ways and there's evidence that says that one of the reasons why people come here is not just because of the opportunities, not just because of the welfare uh, benefits, it's because of the problems from where they're coming. Uh, what, what information you guys have on that and how does that fold into your argument? Well, there was, there was a feast of stuff I would have wanted to challenge and what Ben just said there, but- uh, well, go ahead and go uh, ahead and do that and then answer my the, question. That's in fine. In the end, the, the, the question of why does somebody do better when they come from Haiti? Well, obviously we have a superior uh, cultural um, mix, if you will, of free market capitalism, commercial understandings, we reward industry behavior. But in the end, we obviously can't bring everybody from all over the world who'd like to live here, several billion people, right? I mean, we see already with what Joe Biden's dealing with on the border that the supply vastly outweighs the demand. And so, you know, the lady in the harbor faces away toward the, toward the east, actually. But the idea behind Lady Liberty is that we have ideas to share with the rest of the world in order to help them prosper and understand what those ideas are that advance human understanding or create the ultimate resources, Julian would say. And that's really where the, the, the goal needs to be, not bringing the rest of the world into the U.S. I mean, there's no question economically that if Castro empties out his prisons and insane asylums, it will create jobs for prison guards, social workers, 
uh, people in the criminal justice system. But that isn't necessarily the kind of economic growth we want. I mean, when, when we started deindustrializing and signed all these trade agreements, the idea was before the internet came online is that the US would retain the knowledge jobs and Americans would be in high demand to do knowledge work, whereas the so-called dirty jobs that were in the export competing sector would be done by unionized American workers who were basically being paid tremendous amounts of money for what are essentially lower skilled work, but bringing about more social cohesion and a narrowing of the gap between rich and poor. The internet changed all that, changed knowledge work, along with outsourcing manufacturing at the same time, the American labor force has been hit by a double whammy. You see this in terms of labor force participation and what's happened to wages and working conditions for less skilled Americans. So, right, so Dan, I, Dan, I'm going to be a referee. Ben, I saw you shaking your head again. <laughs> right. Get, all right, give Ben another chance at that one, Ben. Go ahead. Listen, when you say supply and demand's out of whack, look at the crisis in the border. That's precisely because we do not let supply and demand work. The government central planners of the international labor market. This is anti-free enterprise, anti-capitalism, by the way. Government command and control of international labor market of what mix and quantity of immigrants we're going to let in has it wrong based on workers who would like to come here and employers who would like to freely associate and employ them here. And that's precisely why we have a crisis on the border. If we had a more open legal immigration system where these workers could come when they were offered jobs, then we do not have such a problem. Capitalism rides upon a democratic system, okay, that establishes that public will determines how we establish these numerical limits. It's not up to private enterprise to cede the right to give away our community space to private employers or would-be intending immigrants or despots who drive them here. It is ultimately a community function that, that inheres in the essence of the nation state. And so this idea that we're just going to throw open the borders and let supply and demand equal, uh, equilibrate is just, it's fantasy. It's not, this isn't real world policy making. We have to have established limits. And no matter how high the policy sets reasonable limits, there are gonna be far more people who wanna come. What determines how many people wanna come then? How many more people have come recently from the same country through network recruitment, relatives, they hear about what's coming. You don't get a lot of immigration from countries where we haven't had a lot of immigration. You get a lot from where we have had it and there's great income differentials. So, you know, it's not a matter of simply raising the cap 10% and thinking it's all gonna be solved. The more you let in, the more are gonna get in line to come. And so there has to be more to the equation than that. Well, Dan, I would say the more that we let in and the more that wanna come that are economically beneficial, which is what economists find immigration is, the better. If they were destroying our institutions, and this is why I set out to write this whole book, if they were undermining the factors that made them and us productive here, then I'd say, yeah, we should be quantitative limiting this or qualitatively limiting who will come so they won't erode these institutions. But I'm not finding evidence of that. I was looking, the people who make the case that there is don't offer any evidence. So until I see that, the economic gains that economists forecast for both immigrants and the destination country, I believe are there. You know, a critical need to me seems that we're, you know, we don't have the demographic demographic crisis that Japan or Italy has yet, but we really are seeing a situation in the United States where we do not have enough employable people paying taxes, Social Security to take care of Dennis in his retirement. <laughs> like I've combed through the world. So, I've, I've combed through every page of it. Nowhere does Adam Smith say anything about using foreign labor recruitment to increase labor supply. Adam Smith assumed that we would simply have more children in response to increasing labor demand. Now, but that we're not. Going to be a challenge all over the developed world as women become more literate, more educated, have more opportunities. Fertility rates are plummeting. China, obviously, they're going to face the same problem. Everybody who has a bulge and then sees a decline in fertility has this problem of trying to retire a bulge, right, through the retirement system. So does the U.S. But the answer cannot be to start to continue a Ponzi scheme to try to bring in more and more people from all over the world, depending on the skills composition, maybe contributing, maybe not, a welfare system where maybe more go on welfare than native born. It's not so simple that you think you can remedy it by turning on, people are not fungible, they're humans. They vote differently, they behave differently. And I don't understand how Ben can say that immigration is not changing our cultural institutions. The radical left relies upon demographic change to drive this entire sort of jettisoning of the great books and, and, and frankly, the core basis of Western civilization on the strength of, and our liberal arts program on the strength of demographic change. So how can he say it's but, not affecting our but, but, if, but if people are coming in legally, why is this a negative way to rebalance our demography? Well, it, part, it doesn't change the, the actually it doesn't change the age profile enough 
to save us from the bankrupting effects of Social Security. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and address that, Ben, and then I'm going to ask you for something that you think should be done. So go ahead and address what he said, please. Sir, I, actually, I'm probably in agreement that about the uh, Social Security. I mean, I do believe it will prolong Social Security, but uh, unlike most people who advocate for immigration, I think prolonging Social Security is a bad thing. I'd rather have the Ponzi scheme end sooner rather than later. Uh, but immigration will lengthen that. But what I don't see is the immigrants destroying the institutions here. Talk about interstate migration. What's the optimal number of people to move from California to Texas? I know how we decide that. We let laborers bid, uh, laborers look for job, employers bid on services, and make people pay for the cost of their housing. Then we get something like the optimal movement. And people worry about the exact same thing with interstate migration, Texas turning purple. But we don't see that. Non-native-born Texans vote for Republicans at a higher rate than native-born Texans. They identify as conservatives because it's not the average Californian who's moving to Texas. It's the Californian who actually likes Texas who's moving to Texas. Now, culturally, they might bring their avocado toast, but they don't bring their big government politics. That's which is good because statism doesn't get me, and I still get a short line for barbecue. I still don't think that's the evidence doesn't bear that out. I mean, particularly, I mean, first of all, lower skill Americans who are only English speaking in places like Dayton, Ohio, cannot move to Los Angeles or certain of these high growth areas. Cost of living is so much higher. They sell real estate. International migration tends to bid up the cost of real estate, which decreases secondary mobility internally. So you, it actually works against the process of free market labor movement inside the United States for lower skill Americans. That mobility declines. So, you know, remember that the whole capitalist construct of corporate licensing or charters is still based on the consensual nature of democratic government. This system has to rely upon the idea that it's helping the American people at large, right? And these corporations exist to actually help the American people. That's okay, why Dan, Dan hold on a second. Let me, let me uh, you make great arguments in both of you, which is why we like your, both your perspectives. But if, if it were you, if you were sitting in the White House right now and you were trying to convince the people on both sides of the aisle uh, so that we would actually have something like bipartisanship, uh, what would be your solutions? What, what would you say, here are the three things we should do? And then, Ben, I'm going to ask you to respond what, to what Dan says. At the core of this is that 1965, we established a system of chain migration. We have to move toward a system of packet migration. If you want to select an immigrant based on skills, compositions, and, and proprietary knowledge, or what have you, fine. But tell that alien you can come with your spouse and unmarried minor children, but that is it, okay? We have this chain migration process that these skills to flow creates chain migration. That's one. That's Two, one. obviously, interior enforcement, e-verify. Employers have to verify work eligibility. And well, three is going to be a whole bunch of different things. But I mean, frankly, a number of the things that President Trump was doing need to be restated or restored because Biden undid it and created a crisis at the border. OK, good. Those are three things. Great. Ben, go ahead. So I'll give you just two. One's the, the more practical one. If there's going to be a quantitative limit on number of immigrants coming in, immigration planners have no way to plan for the optimal mix of those immigrants. The best way you could do it is with a price system where you just auction off immigration quotas to the highest bidder, whether there's someone who wants to reunite with their cousin, uh, Microsoft who wants to buy a visa for a worker, or hell, an immigration restrictionist who wants to buy the permit and burn it. Uh, that's the only way. How else do you reconcile Microsoft's need for an employee with the subjective attachment from somebody else to grandma? Best way to do that is a, a, a quota market where you actually pay a price and make them bid against each other for it. But that's all constrained by if we're going to have a binding quota. If we don't have a scarcity of quotas, then you don't need to auction them off. And I think the right policy for America is the policy that we had from our founding until the 1920s, which allows anyone from anywhere to come to our shores and pursue their own human potential with the freedoms that America provides. You know, one of the things that I think is very interesting about this, and there's so many issues where you're seeing such partisanship, where the American public feels one way and the representatives are legislating a different way. And I'm looking here and it says 82% of Democrats feel that Americans want a sound immigration policy that provides border security and a path to legal status. Republicans, on the other hand, are just slightly under 50% in desiring that. How do we get closer to a solution? 
we have a crisis of confidence in the government's ability to manage the flow. I mean, one of the things that the costs estimates of immigration don't account for is the actual cost of, of regulating a flow of immigrants, the adjudications process, deportation, all that, very expensive, screening for eligibility. And a lot of those costs aren't included in these empirical studies, but it's very expensive <laughs> to actually remove an alien, take them through the proceedings. Um, it's, it's not an easy or efficient way to recruit labor as much as people would like. Uh, once people have confidence restored in the integrity of the immigration control apparatus, it's much easier to achieve consensus. But we had an 86 amnesty, Ronald Reagan signed it on the promise it was the last amnesty and we would get control of the borders afterward. Since that didn't happen, courtesy of the Chamber of Commerce and other organizations, it stayed out of control. The public is rightly skeptical of the government's promises moving forward. Ben? The politicians in both parties don't want to solve the problem. They want to score political points against each other. Equally true of Democrats and Republicans. Uh, if you want to take the least controversial immigration reform as but done by the polls, it's for the, the so-called dreamers, the illegal immigrants residing in the United States who, who came here as children. The vast majority of, of voters prefer a path to legalization for them, including Republican ones. If either party would put a bill forward that just addressed them, one part of this would be addressed. Anytime I'd like they, to see up, they package it with everything else so that they can score points with each other. Wouldn't it be great if that happened, not just on this issue, but on all the other contentious issues that I mentioned when we started the program? Dennis, I think you're right. This is an issue I understand well why you've done it so often and why we'll continue. Uh, Dan Stein, thank you so much for the work that you do and being with us. And Ben Powell, I've read some of your work and I look forward to reading a lot more of it. Let me remind everybody, your new book is Wretched Refuse. You can always follow Dennis and me by going to uh, your favorite social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever. And please, if you uh, have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, do it today. And you can always watch past shows by going to mcquistontv.com. And remember, we're here to bring perspectives that matter to people who care. For more information, call 214-750-5157 or email nikkiann at nikkimcquistion.com. Visit our website at www.mcquistiontv.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at www.twitter.com slash mcquistiontv or download McQuistion TV video podcast on iTunes. 